Thank you very much for joining everyone and uh, welcome to the talk, Better C++ Ranges. So uh, yes, um, I am working for ThinkCell. We are a software company in Berlin and we write everything we do in C++ and as a part of that, we are developing our own range library uh, that is that's compatible with the the standard ranges. And uh, I want to talk in this talk, I want to talk a little bit about what we did, why we did things sometimes differently, and where we could extend things beyond the, the ranges that you know from the C20 standard. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about why we actually have ranges. So in the beginning, before prior to C20, uh, we did things with iterators. And let's uh, this is quite typical iterator code that you see here. So let's say you have a container and you want to sort this container and you have to plug in the begin and end iterator for the sorting. And then when you want to then remove duplicate elements, you call vector erase, again with std unique, begin and end iterator. It will output, it will compact that vector and output yet another iterator. And then you have to erase everything that you don't want by again plugging in an iterator, the vector end to the erase. So you have to mention vec and begin and end many, many times. And this can be done much more elegantly if we combine the begin and end into a single object. And then you could write it instead like this. You just say we sort the vector and then we unique the vector and you still need the end for the erasing. Now, before I continue, um, yes, yeah, so if you if you don't have a C++20 compiler, um, there is actually the um, Eric Niebler, who is the inventor of the C++20 standard library ranges, um, has an implementation of them on his GitHub for compilers that don't support yet C++20. So uh, you can also take a look there if you want to play with it. Now, um, before I go on, um, there's actually a mistake in the code. So vector.erase, std unique, vec, vec.end. Um, it actually has, has a problem. Um, the std unique is for doing the uniqueness, um, is, is, doing, is using the equal operator. And the std sort before it is using the less operator to the sorting. So you have to make sure that if you do such a construct, the equality operator and the equal operator or the less operator and the equal operator are actually compatible with each other. And this, um, you can actually solve this problem by encapsulating, by wrapping this kind of code into a, a single function um, that then just uses the same less operator for, for sorting, and then basically the greater equal, the turned around less operator for uniquing, and then you avoid this problem. All right. Um, why do I think we know something about ranges? Um, as I said already, we have a range library. It evolved 20 years ago from boost range. And we have about a million lines of production code by now that use that library. And we have a luxury that uh, we have the library and the production code that uses it together in-house. And so these two evolved together. We have um, actually one developer, he is uh, doing nothing but refactoring. So um, we have the luxury that we can actually, whenever we find something wrong with the library, we can change the production code. Uh, and that, you, that fixes this, this problem, this chicken egg problem that you usually have in library development, where, well, if you're starting to develop your library, you're free to do whatever you want, but uh, no one is using the library, so you don't really know what to do. But once your library is in, in wide use, you can't change it anymore because once you change it, people will complain that you changed it. And we avoid this problem by having these two things together. Now, here is again my wrapping function, and we do have that in the library. The, uh, the library is available on, on GitHub uh, under ThinkCell. And um, yeah, so, so it's a good idea to, to write wrappers like that, um, that, that solve these problems, which, which so you have a consistent um, less and consistent operator less and consistent operator equal. And of course, you can have the same with a with a predicate. All right. So what are ranges? Um, ranges can be containers, like we've seen on the example, the vector string list. 
they own their elements, and whenever you copy them, you copy the elements with them. So you have deep copying. You also have deep constness, so that if the container is const, you can't mutate any of the elements. Now, there are also views, and together with containers, they kind of make up ranges. So what are views? Uh, views, and this is kind of the quintessential view that I have here, the, the subrange. The view is essentially what we know in, in, in pre-range programming as a pair of iterators. Um, the pair of iterators references the elements. It doesn't copy the elements when you copy the iterators. And it has shallow constness. So you would have, if, if your iterator is const, then you can still mutate the elements through that iterator. And the const iterator is a different beast from the iterator that is just merely const. And the const iterator would just then disallow you to modify the elements. But even if you make it, mutate, um, if you make it uh, mutable, if you're mutable, a const iterator is still a const iterator. So, um, and, and this is really the simplest view you can have. It's just a pair of iterators, um, encapsulating a pair of iterators. And you would basically iterate through it like you would iterate through a container with, where you can get iterators from it with begin and end. And uh, it would then, well, give you out the iterators that it's stored. Now, these, the views can get a little bit more interesting. And um, I will discuss here the probably two of the of the most important adapters, range adapters, int more interesting views. Um, let's say you have an algorithm here that uh, finds a four in a vector of one to three, one to four, and the iterator will then point to the four. Now, and you're using range find. Now, if you want to do the same thing, but the 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 four. Um, is really stored in a in a structure in a structure A, then the um, you you cannot really use find because you you need to need to look into your structure A and and check for the equality with ID. Um, so you would need a predicate, and in addition you're also not using find but you're using find if so you can actually use a predicate. So these two things, looking for a value of four, are similar in semantics, but they're not really similar in syntax. You're using two different functions, which is kind of ugly. Now, enter the transform adapter to solve this problem. Um, so here, when you are, you again have a structure A, and you have an, a vector of, of, of A, and you are then transforming this vector by lazily by applying a transform adapter. And what that does is this, this V um, piping into view transform here is it creates an object that by itself doesn't transform anything. Only when you iterate it over it, for every, um, every time you are, you are taking an iterator out of, out of that, that object and you reference that iterator, that iterator would apply the transformation and essentially do the projection on ID. So effectively, logically, semantically, this is then a range over ints. And, and within these ints, the range find can find a four. Now, that would actually, at the end, you, when, you, when you run this, um, the iterator here would point to ints because the range here is a range over ints. Now, it's quite frequent that you say, well, I don't want the int back. I actually want the iterator onto my original vector. And you can do that with a dot base. So you have an iterator dot base, and that will bring you back to iterators to your, into your original vector. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, um, just ask them in the Q&A, and I will answer them when I see them and as, as I go along. Now, here is how you would implement such or one possible implementation of a transform adapter. So um, the, we have a transform view, and that transform view has iterators. And each one of these iterators carries around the function for transforming the elements. And when you're dereferencing the iterator, then the function would be called on the result of the original iterator. And I already mentioned the base function. It will just 
return you the original iterator. So every iterator is carrying around this base iterator. And, and whenever you dereference it, it dereferences the base iterator. And um, yes, it, it should be. Stat vector should be a stack vector of A instead of int. You're right. Previous slide, I'll, I'll show it to you right here. Imagine there should be an A here. OK, I'll fix it. Um, so here you have, you have the base iterator, and you have the function. And every time you dereference, you get the function gets applied to the dereferenced iterator. Now, the second adapter uh, that's, that's quite important, and these together really make up a, a large portion of, of the adapters uh, that you are going to use, is the filter. So um, here you have, again, a vector of, of A's. And you are filtering with the predicate that pulls you out all the A's where the ID is for. And again, this is lazy. So the filtering will not happen immediately when you're writing this, this, this expression. But that object that will first be stored in range and will, won't do anything. And only once you then start iterating over range, um, it, will, it will actually pull out the elements that you want, the ones where ID is for. Now, here's a possible implementation of the filter. Um, the, the thing that you really need to modify here is, the, is in this case, I'm, you could also have the decrement, but I have the increment here. So if, you, if all you need is a forward iterator, then the increment would increment once, and then it will keep skipping elements until you hit um, a... Um, you hit the... The, the, um, the iterator. The, if I want to hit something that you actually want to keep. And um, the interesting part is here that you have to carry around your functor. And you also need, for iteration, you, um, you need the end iterator. And you need the end iterator because this loop here has to um, start, it has to make sure that you're not running off the end. And here's also why do you have the static cast bool? Well, the static cast bool is essentially, if you have an overloaded not, then it's not really clear what should happen. So I, we want to make sure that you're basically evaluating this expression in a Boolean context. OK. Um, so once we are looking at this, uh, so inside the, the, the filter, we need a functor, and we need these two iterators. And that's an iterator of your filter. Now, if you are stacking filters, which is quite frequent that you're going to do this, not necessarily in one function, but if you're basically creating an object, you're passing it into another function, and there it again gets filtered and so on, it's quite possible that you get these stacked views, these stacked adapters. And let's take a look at how a filter would look like that is, is stacked three times. And here is the iterator of such a stacked filter. The problem is that every iterator contains the functor and, again, two iterators. And these two iterators, again, will contain, well, a functor and two iterators. So you can see that you get this exponential explosion of the size of your iterator. And Boost Range actually did this. And that's something that they noticed when they developed the standard library and said, mm, this is not something we can actually, we, we can do. That's, that's terribly inefficient. So um, you have to keep iterators small, otherwise your, your, your loops are not going to be very fast if you're moving around these big objects. And the idea is that the adapter object itself is going to carry around everything that is common for all the iterators. So in this case, what's common is the functor and the end. Now, the iterators then would carry around the base iterator and a pointer to the base range, to, to the adapter object. So whenever it needs these common, this common data, it would actually just use that reference that it's carrying around. Now, that's what C++20 is doing. Uh, and it, as a consequence, the C++20 iterators cannot outlive their range. So they are limited by their lifetime, by default, to the range that they are iterating over not unlike with containers. And there's a special trait 
that basically where you can opt out. If you know that your 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 range is is only using iterators pointing to some base range and you're not adding any data to it, um, this trait will tell you, no, no, that's okay. You can actually um, have the range go out of scope. But by default, it's limited to the lifetime of the range, the iterator lifetime. Now, um, there are a few other things uh, to point out. When you are doing ranges find and you're, you're finding something inside this expression, it actually doesn't compile. And that may seem a bit surprising. The reason is that this is an R value. And the range is find would return an R value, an, an iterator to this R value range. And the fear is that this R value range will go out of scope. And so the, the standard doesn't allow running such a thing. The, our library, this turned out to be pretty impractical, and our library does allow it, um, but that's kind of a matter, matter of choice. So um, in the standard, you would have to write that as a separate expression outside of that um, algorithm call, um, and then this would compile. Um, keep in mind here, this doesn't really dangle because we do this dot base, right? So we are, we are, creating, a, um, we are creating the range, but immediately with the dot base, we're basically unwrapping it again. And so it, in this case, you would not really get a dangling iterator. But the danger is there that if someone is not using dot .base, um, and that's not an analysis, analysis that, the, that the library is doing, um, then you would get one. So they, they just don't let you compile it. OK, um, right. So you wouldn't get actually a dangling reference. And the way to silence this error would be you just write a TCSL value, which basically just takes, or yeah, that would be in our library, so some sort of so you, you take the R value and you, you R value reference and you turn it into an L value reference to silence that and say, yeah, yeah, it's okay. I understand. I, I know what I'm doing. Okay, um, let's look at our problem again. How does the, the, the iterator of these filters look like? Um, you could use um, ranges find you, you in, in the, from, the, from the library. And I think that the main reason this you can actually write with, the question is, can you use the projection argument of ranges find? Yes, you can. For this kind of purpose, you could. Um, the, the, the problem with, with this projection argument is that you can only, you, you cannot stick this into a separate function. Sometimes you want to transform something, you want to stick it into a separate function, and there you want to keep working on it. And then these, so, so, uh, then logically, you would kind of your 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 range would consist of of a projection function and the actual range. So you would you, these these two things together, um, really, which is really like a transform. So you could use a projection here um, if you want to do it locally like this, and then you don't need the TCSL value. So for this local example, it would work. Now let's look at the the filter and um, how the iterator looks like. You would still get um, the you would still get a stack like this because every iterator contains a pointer to its underlying range. So to its, to its the iterator, to, its, to the range that you pulled the iterator out of. And so at every level, the iterator again has a pointer to its, 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 its view object, its range object. So you get linear growth of, of iterators. And that's still not great. Really, ideally, you would like to have an iterator that is, that is of, of constant size, that, is, that always stays small, no matter how large your stack is. And we went in the library, went beyond the C20 ranges. It's one of the things that we added um, that allows you to build these stacks and keep the iterator small. Um, someone is asking this LSL value that I mentioned, whether, that's, uh, whether that can fail. No, it cannot really fail. It, you will just, it, it's basically just disabling the safety. So if you're running SL value, you're just silencing the error, disable the safety, and uh, then you're basically on your own. So back to the next concept. Um, this, is a, this is the concept of avoiding these larger stacks and keeping the iterators small. And the idea is that you are this, this index concept is kind of like an iterator, but the operations on that, on that index require you to plug in the range object as well. 
And because you have to plug in the range object, you can implement these, iterate, these operations on the range object. So here I have the index range object, and here are the functions. They are a little bit like the functions that you would need for iterators. There's an increment, a decrement, there's a dereference. They're very much like the functions you need for an iterator. And you can get the begin index and the end index. And that would then describe your range. And, but whenever you want to increment the index, then you would have to plug them into the, into the member function of index range. And so that member function has available the index plus the underlying range. Now, of course, you are not going to convince the whole world of switching from iterators to indices and always using this kind of interface. So we need compatibility between iterators and indices. And here it is. Um, if you have an iterator, and you want to treat it like an index, it's pretty trivial um, because your, your index, your, every iterator is essentially an index. It can carry out the operations by itself. So if, you want, if, if we are wrapping this in, in a way, if someone wants to use the index interface, we can provide wrappers that just say, okay, if you have an iterator and not a real index, just discard the range and, and execute the operation on the iterator directly. So this direction is, is really very simple. The other direction is only slightly more difficult um, because we can always wrap the index into an iterator which contains the pointer to the underlying range and the index. And whenever we are want, to, want to execute some operation, like an increment, for example, we could just combine the two and call the increment index operation on the range with the index. And you can see here that as long as we can keep the index small, then that's going to be efficient. The iterator is going to have essentially the size of a pointer plus the small size of the index. And we'll see how good our chances are that we can keep the index small. Here's uh, a filter view implemented with indices. And you can see that the index of this filter view um, is the same is the same as the index of the base range. The reasoning here is that the index is essentially just the position where you are in your base range while you're filtering. And that doesn't, doesn't get larger if you are adding more filters. The position is always just the position essentially of the iterator of the underlying container. So it's, it's one pointer or a few pointers. And the increment index uh, can then be implemented like this. You basically ask the base to increment the index because it's the, the index is the, is the same type as the index of the base. And you do that until you are either hitting the end and you again can ask your base for the end or your, your filter says, okay, this is a good one. Um, please, please stop here. I want to dereference this index. So that way we are getting a, you can, you can build filters arbitrarily large um, and you still have only every iterator has only two pointers, no matter how deeply you are stacking them. Now, there's also a special thing we already talked about the effect of, of R values uh, on algorithms in the standard library. Um, there is a similar thing with, uh, with views on R values. So let's say you are creating a vector and then you are creating a range um, that is filtering that vector. So this would work just fine. The view is a reference and with, with shallow copy and shallow constants and it doesn't contain any, any elements, any values. And the actual values would be created, contained in the vector and the range just holds a reference to the vector. So far, so good. Now, what happens when you want to create the vector in place, when you would just want to create a vector right there without assigning it to a separate, uh, you do it to a separate expression, so a separate variable, and, and filter that? Well, this doesn't compile in the standard because um, the, the standard insists that these views are lightweight. They are essentially all of one copy. They are, they are, they are shallow constants. Um, and... And you cannot, you, you, you cannot really put an, the values of a vector in there. So they, they made this not compile. Now, this would be all good um, if it 
would be always possible to write the create vector as a separate variable. But that's not always so easy. For example, here uh, with the function foo, you're creating a vector, and then you want to return this vector in a laserly filtered way. Um, and, and the naive way would say, well, if I need both, I need the filter and the vector, maybe I can return them as a tuple. But of course, that doesn't work because the filter contains a, a, a pointer not to the vector and the tuple, but to the vector on the stack, in the, in the stack frame of the, of the function foo. And so you would get a dangling reference if you do that. That doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, so the, the problem here is there, is there is no real good way to, to implement this kind of pattern, which may lead people to actually not do the filter lazily, but, but eagerly say, well, if I have to return this thing, then I, I already have to filter out the values, which may be inefficient. Maybe you don't need that filtering right away. Maybe you only need the first element of the filtered vector in certain scenarios, and, and then it's, it's wasteful to filter it eagerly and, and then just you know, use the first element, throw the rest away. So, um, how can we solve this problem? Now, if the adapter input is an L value container, right, then, then our filter, the, the, the improved filter, would still create a view. It would be just like what the standard library does. It's, it's reference of one copy, shallow constants, and so on. On the other hand, if your adapter is an R value container, the filter could actually create a container. It could actually incorporate the values into its object. Now, it doesn't have the, the O of one copy anymore. It would have deep copy, deep constants, but it would still be lazy. So in that way, the laziness and the containerness of, of ranges could be orthogonal things. You could have a, a, a lazy referencing range um, with, with like, like in the first part here, where it's, it's lazy and it's... It's, uh, it, it's just a reference. But you can also say, well, it's or a view. And, and here, it's actually a container. So, but it's still lazy. It's a, it's a lazy container. And, and there's nothing wrong with it, I think. It it's comes, comes in handy quite frequently. Um, there's another thing we can improve on, on algorithms. Um, right now, algorithms usually, when like, like a find, returns an iterator. Right? And the thing is that if, if you didn't find anything, then it returns the end iterator, which makes you have to compare the, the end iterator in your code. So quite frequently, you would have a find, and then if the find does not end, then you, you do something. Now, let's try something else. Let's say um, we, we, uh, we customize the way things are returned from algorithms. And this is actually something that we stole a little bit from, from Boost Range. They had, they had one implementation of that, of that, that idea. Um, so what is happening is that when, you are, when, when something is found, you call a customization point, which you plugged in as a template parameter. So in this case, it would be, for example, this customization point, element or end, and when you pack when you're packing an iterator, then it would just return the iterator when you have an it when you found an iterator. And if the, the algorithm tells you, hmm, I didn't find anything, please return a singleton, return a, return a null kind of, then it would just pick the range end and and use it as the signal that you that you don't have uh, that you didn't find anything. So far, we didn't, we didn't gain anything. We're still getting end iterators here. But we can now do something else. We can say, hmm, the, the case that you didn't find anything, that's not valid in my program. I, I want to write an assert that what's being returned is, is not end. Now, writing this, uh, this assert is quite verbose. So what we can do instead, we could just specify that in, in that customization point that this singleton case never occurs. It would be a, a, a program error if, if we, would, we would have such a case. And that's, that's quite expressive. You can write what you mean. Quite in, in, it's very easy to read in the code. It's like, okay, this find would really find something. Now, you can also do something like this. Um, we have a little wrapper around iterators, which make it a nullable type. 
So there is essentially a null iterator. Whenever, whenever you have an, an iterator-like thing, you, you can make it a, a, a null. Um, and that, that supports the Boolean operator. So instead of checking for, uh, for end, you can just say, check for, for true-ish. And uh, then your code will look like this, which is, which is awfully much nicer. There's no more end check that you have expl to do explicitly. And instead, you you are just uh, you are just specifying that you want the null back. And of course, when you are working on on iter on, on pointers, um, you already have a null pointer. So in that case, you can say, well, if, if I I don't need any wrapper around my iterator, if the iterator is an, is a pointer, I already have my null and I can use it. Um, there is here's another idea. Um, the when you are ranges um, are semantically just some collection of things that you can iterate over. And um, when you have a, a generator like a for each or something like this, where you traverse a data structure, where you stick elements of that data structure into a sink, um, that's, that's very much like a range except that it doesn't have iterators. And it would be awfully nice if we would treat, like to treat these things just like a range. So you can write things like this. You could say, okay, I'm, I'm having an any off um, over this range here. Except it's not really a range, but it's, it's behaving like a range. So it'd be nice to write this piece of code so that we can use it with all kinds of range algorithms. Now, what's really going on here? Um, right now, with the iterators, we really support only what's called external iteration. With external iteration, the consumer calls the producer to get a new element. And one example are C++ iterators. So you are, whenever you are calling the producer to create new data, star it, then the star it, the dereferenced iterator, will return you a new element. And the consumer is at the bottom of the stack, and the producer is at the top of the stack. So being at the bottom of the stack in general is quite nice, because uh, you can write a contiguous code path for iterating over your whole range. Makes it easier to write, and you also have, have better performance, because the state that your algorithm is currently in while you're iterating is encoded in the instruction pointer. So you, you, can, you can write one pro control flow that describes what you want to do. And you have unlimited stack memory. So your stack memory will, you, you can, whatever you, are, you want to store on the stack, you can store on the stack until it overflows. Now the producer, when it's at the top of the stack, doesn't have these advantages. It only has a contiguous code path for each individual item. Because when you're, when you're a dereference and iterator, when you're returning from the dereference, your, your, your code path essentially is, is joining again. And the next time you're called with star it, you don't know where you are in your data structure, which maybe is, is, is costing you performance because you kind of have to restore where you are in your iteration of the data structure. Now, that also makes the, the producer at the top of the stack harder to write because you have to restore the state. And you may have worse performance. Um, so that is because of the single entry point. You have to restore the state. But also because you only have a fixed amount of memory you can store. I mean, the, the, the stack will always, be, uh, will always be, be flushed again when you're returning from your function. So you cannot store anything on the stack between calls to the producer. Now, internal iteration turns this whole thing on its head the producer will call the consumer to offer a new element. So examples are these, these visitor patterns or a, the for each something functions. And there, the producer has all the advantages of, of being at the bottom of the stack. And the consumer has all the disadvantages of being at the top of the stack. So, and right now, we don't have that option really with iterators to do it that way. Now, of course, it would be much nicer if both have, would have this prime spot at the bottom of the stack. Um, and yes, you can do that with coroutines. And here, it's, it's, I wrote kind of how would you write this function with a coroutine. Um, the, the problem with it is 
that when you when you're when you're writing code like when you when you're writing coroutines, um, you really have two options, and one is stackful, where you really have two different stacks. That's that's not what the C plus plus twenty coroutines are doing, um, but you can do it. The problem with it is if you have really two different stacks and switch between these two different st stacks when you switch coroutines, that's quite expensive. They're usually implemented as, as operating system fibers, and you have to flush all kinds of registers and, and do context switches when you're switching between these, these fibers. And uh, you also need one megabyte of virtual memory per coroutine because you're you are building up a full stack. Now, both is not exactly lightweight, so the, there's a good reason that C++20, when it introduced coroutines, didn't go this route. Instead, they introduced stackless coroutines. And the problem here is that if you are using a coroutine, um, the, the stackless coroutine, the, 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 the compiler has to put together the size of the, the, the stack space that it actually needs. And to put together that stack space, all the, func all the, all the subroutines that you're calling um, all, the, all the functions you're calling also have to be coroutines. So you are, by, by doing this, you are, your whole call tree is essentially coroutinified. Um, and this becomes particularly ugly when you want to do something like this, where you're running ranges for each. Now, and you want to do, you know, you want to do this on all windows, you want to call, call your coroutine here. Well, the problem is your ranges for each itself is not a coroutine. So this doesn't work. You would essentially need to replicate the whole standard library as as a coroutine. So you can do, you know, you can call coroutines inside because the whole call tree has to be a coroutine. Now, certainly this is all possible, but um, and and oh, there's another disadvantage. It's still a bit expensive. So uh, the stackless coroutine is cannot be optimized quite as well yet by the compiler as a function call. So there's a much better optimizations for function calls. Um, one reason is that for a coroutine, your resume point where you're resuming the coroutine is usually some sort of, it, it, it's, it's, some, it's, it's dynamic. It, it's not going to restart always at the same place, just like with a function call. And um, so the compiler has to do an analysis whether it can, it can determine at any given point where to continue that coroutine. And, it, and if it's dynamic, then, then there are just optimizations you cannot do. There's no aggressive inlining you can do. You may have to store, save, restore some, some, uh, some registers, yes, and, and no aggressive inlining. OK, um, now you can go this route, and I think the standard library is going this route uh, with, with using coroutines more uh, in, in connection with iterators. Um, but often, it's, it's overkill. It, it puts a lot of burden on the compiler and makes things more complicated. And internal iteration is often just good enough. So if you are doing an algorithm that is, 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 is doing a find, then no, you cannot use internal iteration if you want an iterator out. If you want a value out, it's actually OK. You can actually store the value. Um, and, and then internal iteration is good enough. Binary search, yeah, without iterators, it's probably not going to work. Um, but there are many other algorithms that work. For each works, accumulate all of, any of, none of. They all work with internal iteration. Actually, for each, which is used quite often, is the quintessential internal iteration function. Because all you're really doing is you're saying, OK, for each contains the body of, of, of what I want to be called for every element. So this can without any harm, live on the top of the stack. It doesn't need to be at the bottom of the stack. So we give it this prime spot at the bottom of the stack, and then we just kind of throw away this advantage and say, oh, we, we, you iterate, I have to live with the top of the stack. We could live at the bottom of the stack, but we don't really need it. I mean, the for each is happy at the top of the stack. So why not have then the range, the producer, live at the bottom of the stack and read the benefits? Now, you can also write adapters with internal iteration. Um, there is, there is it's a filter and a transform, uh, both can be, can be phrased as, uh, with internal iteration. So you can just write them around top of stack producers. So what we want, um, at the bottom of the stack producers, so what we want is uh, we want to allow ranges that only support internal iteration. Now let's see how they would look like. So uh, the any of, for example, as an algorithm, um, would, could be implemented like this. You just simply for each over the range, the range 
produces all the all the values, and then you are you're doing a Boolean context uh, um, evaluation of your parameter, and then you order the results together, and that would be the any off. Well, not quite, um, because the any off would stop whenever true is encountered. So whenever you have true, everything stops. Now. How do we do that? How will we stop iterating? How can we tell the producer to stop iterating um, when, when we don't want any, other, any, more, any more values? And the first idea that we had were exceptions. Of course, that doesn't work. It's way too slow. Um, the second idea is we introduce a special enum, break or continue. Um, and that enum is being returned and, and basically tells the producer whether to continue producing or whether to stop. So that's, that's here. Um, now, the nice thing is that we can wrap this break or continue um, into, um, into an integral constant. So you can have functions that by at, at compile time, you can find out whether they always continue. In fact, we, we have the semantics that if it returns anything but always uh, break or continue, that actually also means continue. So you can return a void or you can return an integral constant continue, and then the compiler can find out this guy doesn't, is never going to gonna break, so I can elide the break, stop, the, the break check. So I, I don't lose anything in, in efficiency if I don't want to ever stop. Now... Some things, uh, it, so this, this internal iteration um, is not only good for things where you don't have iterators for. Um, it can also improve performance. One good example is, is concat, and concat would concatenate the, the um, items of two ranges. Here I have two containers, a list and a vector, and they are being concatenated. Now, if you write a, such a concat range uh, with, with indices, or iterators, then it would look kind of something like that. You, your index of the concat range would be a variant of the two indices of the underlying range. And you would essentially either be in one range or in the other range with your iteration. So the, that's why you have this variant. Now, you also have to hold references to the ra two ranges. OK, that's, that's pretty natural. And when you then want to increment that, that index, you would have to branch. You have to decide, OK, if I am in the first, if I'm still iterating in the first container, then I have to increment my using, using basically the first index. I have to say, OK, I got the first index. It's pointing to the first container. Let's ask the first container to increment my index. And if I reach the end of that container, then I switch to the next container. If I am already in the second container, I, I can actually just increment, ask the second container to increment. Now, this includes a branch. Every time you are incrementing your, your iterator, you have to decide which container you're in, which is pretty wasteful. You have to do this for every single element of the, of the container. Oh, yeah. Now, dereferencing actually is the same. So we are first incremented. I have to branch on which container I'm in. On the reference, you again have to branch. You have to decide, okay, if I'm, if I'm on in index, I'm index one, if I have index one, then um, you have to dereference the index one. Otherwise, I have to dereference the index two. So again, you have a branch. So per consumed int, uh, item, you at least have these two branches, which is really clumsy. Now, how could you solve that? How could you avoid all these branches? Well, if you only need internal iteration, you can just use internal iteration. You can just use a generator. And that's really just like that. You have here, and I, I didn't have the, the, the break or continue here um, included, you have a, an operate. This is, this is basically the, the functor that receives the sync of your, of your internal iteration. And then once you receive that sync where you want to plug in your values, um, you can just use for each twice, first on the first range, then on the second range. And while these two for each is running, of course, they're not checking anything. They are just using the underlying for each of the, of the underlying range. And so this is, this is very efficient. It's, it's just as efficient as if you would write two separate loops. Um, so a point here is that even iterator-based ranges 
they they sometimes or they often actually benefit from having a, a generator interface of having having supporting internal iteration. So if someone is happy with internal iteration, doesn't need anything more complicated, then um, uh, then you can actually uh, you you can actually revert to internal iteration. And yes, I'm never talking about boost range. I'm when it's TC, it's usually TC range. So everything that's not in the standard is is our library. Someone is asking in the in the chat. Okay. Um, now, what else can we do with ranges? Um, so there is a new std format in the standard library, and it writes actually to output iterators. Now, output iterators are a form of internal iteration because you are calling for every single item that you are producing, you are calling um, a, the, 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 the star it assignment, and you're essentially offering that, uh, that element to be appended somewhere. And, and that, 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 that offering is, is really internal iteration. So let's rewrite these formatters, these string formatters, as generator ranges. So then, so we have something like this. We have this TCS deck, and it it turns a, a floating point number together with the number of decimal digits into a generator range, into an internal iteration range. And it can be now used just like it, it, it is a range. So you can now concatenate to all these three ranges, two of which are just string literals. But the third one is this internal iteration generator range that is offering its, its items. And we can concatenate them all and basically have, have done our string formatting. And the nice thing is that we don't have a separate std format um, concept or, or, or idea. Um, it, it all put, like, merges together nicely with ranges. We, we only have ranges. Now, um, keep in mind here, this is not like IO stream. IO stream accepted um, that you put in these values that you want to print um, somewhere into your stream. And then they would magically convert to, to, to a string. Uh, that's not the case here. So this would be invalid. This does not compile. The F itself is, is, not, a, is not a range. Uh, but you can turn it into a range if you tell it how it should be formatted, for example, with this TCS deck. Now, it's really trivial to, ex to, to, um, to, to customize these formatters now. For a std format, you would have to write quite complicated formatters. It's certainly possible, but they are not really, they, you know, they, 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 they are really customizing std format. Here, um, you are just writing really a function that is returning a range. And this, this is used, we've, we also have some, some web code, some, some web server code, and this is used extensively in that web server code, putting together these complicated expressions, kind of like an expression, you know, like an expression tree that then gets evaluated once it's expanded into some sort of container. So here you're, you're, you're having your concat, it's being returned. This is still lazy. It still does not get expanded to anything um, when it's being returned. And only when you then say, here, it's still not expanded, only when you actually put it into a container, it would get expanded to actual, to actual characters. Now, um, what you would also want probably are placeholders uh, for, for example, internationalization. So um, if you, you, you can write kind of these kind of things, and in here you can have placeholders, and these placeholders are again replaced by, by, by ranges. They, it's essentially, you could, you could also have a string here. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. This is just, just think character range. Um, now, yeah, there's also support for, format, for, for named arguments. So you don't have to write a zero. You can write, say, amount, and then you bind together that, that's, that range here together with some sort of name. Now, um, what's a bit special here is that the formatting parameters, you, you may expect them to be part of the format string. 
um, there is a very deliberate decision not to do that because these format strings usually go through, when, when you do internationalizations, these format strings usually go through translators. So you send them to a translation agency, it turns it into some a, a string of a, of a different language, and then you're using that string. And we don't really want usually these, these formatting parameters to be part of these, of these strings because the, the translator can't do anything with them anyway. Um, and, and you probably don't want them to change anything. You, you, they're probably going to be more likely break, to break something um, than, than to do any good. Okay. Um, now, let's, now we talked about all these ranges and, and how we can do string formatting into these ranges. Um, how can we actually put them into containers? Now, the std string um, gives us empty construction, right? So when you are constructing with no argument, then uh, it's, it's, empty cons it's, it's, it's an empty string. Now, you can also construct it from a literal or another string. I think it would be quite natural if you could also um, construct the string from a range or, yeah, first of all, from one range. And here you have this one range with, with TC concat. Uh, and so you can simplify that, but just by omitting the TC concat. You can just say, well, I can, I can put together this string from multiple, from multiple arguments, and they are just concatenated. Of course, this doesn't work. That's why it says suggested. Um, this doesn't work in the standard library. Um, but first of all, are we losing anything if we if we want this? If, if we basically say, okay, we really want these constructors in our in 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 the std string. So what about existing constructors in the std string? So here we have three of them. Um, so we can we can take a look. Right? I mean, it's, it's already a, a, a tiny bit confusing. Um, so the first one is actually undefined behavior because it takes three elements from the A, which only contains two elements, the A and the null terminator. Um, so that's a buffer overrun. Now, the second one adds 65 times control C, which is probably also not what you want. Uh, and finally, the last one is OK. It, it adds three times the A. Um, I think it would be much nicer to say, well, Let's, let's deprecate these constructors. Really, what you could write is something, um, something like a TC repeat n, right? Um, so here, you, this, this is basically it separates the what am I producing? I'm producing three times the a from putting that into a container. And uh, someone already suggested uh, why should we add new constructors to std string? Well, we can't really add new new constructors to std string. Remember, this is all used in production code, so, so we're not like modifying the C++ st uh, standard. But what we are doing is actually something quite, quite similar um, um, to, to a two-string function. Um, if a little bit more general, we basically say when we, whenever we have basically constructors that we would like to add um, or remove, then um, we, we have our our pseudo function that is our pseudo constructor. So we just have an explicit cast um, where we tell it which 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 uh, which um, element or which which type to construct. In this case, it's string, and then we pass in the parameters that we want to pass in. And this the explicit cast takes care of the compatibility, the glue code, um, to turn these constructors into a constructor that the standard library understands. Um, this is not exclusive, exclusive to containers. It also works with things like uh, numbers from, from one arithmetic uh, type to another arithmetic type, where you want to, for example, check that the range, that the range doesn't overflow. Um, you could also put that into explicit cost. Now, there's also a wrapper for, for m place back. Um, because here you similar, have a similar problem. You basically have to make sure that this M place will actually use explicit cast if it's needed. And, and so you can write things in the library, you can write things then like this, where you have a vector of strings and, and this is automatically then turned into a std string if you do the M place back. That's kind of neat. Um, you can also do a, a TC append. So there you append onto a container. Similar rules, you have also this nary uh, append where you can list multiple ranges. 
Now, how do we do this efficiently? Um, so probably the fastest way we could do this is we determine the string length first up front, then allocate the memory for the whole string at once, and then just fill in the characters. Uh, that would be probably the, the, the fastest way we could turn a string into, into a container. Now, let's, let's try first uh, what we can do. Okay, let's, let's see. So here's a very simple implement implementation of this explicit cast for ranges, um, or for, for containers, in fact. So we could just kind of call the container constructor of, with, with two iterators. Now, the problem here already is that for non-random access ranges, and that I, I didn't know that before, I ran into it when I, when I programmed it, um, the constructor, the string constructor, will run actually twice over the range. It will first run over it to determine the size, and then actually to begin copying. Now, that used to be fine when iterators were basically just pointers into memory and it was cheap to, over, to iterate over them. But with all these, these adapters and, and stacks of adapters that we potentially have, it may actually involve calculations and, and complicated stuff to, uh, to, um, to iterate over, over the whole range. So um, maybe we would actually be better off first uh, determining the size some other way, or if, if nothing else, then just to reallocate the string several times uh, but only iterate once, because we know how expensive it is to, to reallocate, but we don't really know how expensive it's going to be to iterate twice or to iterate at all. So um, what we can do, for example, is to say, well, if the range has a size member, so if, if our, our concat exposed a size member, we could actually take advantage of that. We could say, okay, we first uh, reserve as much memory as we need, and then we end place back all the elements um, into the container explicitly, so we avoid any any iterating any any iterating twice. Now there's also TC append, right? And TC append would do something similar. It would also reserve for first the size of the container and then uh, append the elements. Now the problem is um, that reserve is actually evil, so be very careful with dot reserve. The problem with dot .reserve is that dot .reserve will ma make the container as large exactly as needed um, to, to fit whatever you pass as an argument. So if you're running append now with small snippets of range repeatedly, then for each range, the container is going to reallocate and it's always going to increase in size bit by bit. Now, that's not terribly nice. Um, what we can do instead is we can rewrite the cont reserve or the, the, the container reserve and say, well, if we actually need to do anything, if our capacity is not large enough, make sure that you en enlarge the capacity at least by some constant factor. So that when you have to do this again, um, you are, are likely not to have to re reallocate again and you get amortized constant number of allocations Per um, uh, per element that you are that you are that you are adding, and then you can use that cont reserve here, that safe cont reserve, for our append. Now, what do we do if we don't have uh, don't have random access? Um, so this is this is basically this was our case where well we don't have random access if we have random access then the range can answer the question about size if it is not random access we may have a size of that range that we can that we can expose although the range itself is not random access what do we do with generator ranges we haven't talked about them right so we, that's what we started with we wanted the std format we said is using generator ranges it's not using iterator based ranges so we need to do something to accommodate those as well now the idea is um, that we use a special sync for a container so whenever we are appending that's essentially equivalent to creating a an appender for a particular container a special sync for a particular container and then passing the elements into them. Now, this is a little bit like, uh, like generating an output iterator for a container, like an, an appending iterator. Uh, 
in this case, though, the appender can be a customization point. Um, it's you, we we can we can for certain containers we can we can modify what kind of appender we are using, and the default one would look like this. It would just simply do an M place back, right? So nothing special here. And uh, yeah, and then is, isn't that just back inserter? Well, yes, it is for this particular case. Um, it would be, but we don't have a reserve, right? So, um, and we probably want we want to. So, for a reserve, as you can see here, this appender takes the elements one by one, right? Um, now, if we want to do a reserve upfront, we need to know about the whole range. We know how much is you know. We need to know how much is coming, and. We need so we can actually call size on it. We need to we need to, we need the whole range. So let's say the the sinks of our of our ranges in general have a new customization point. You can either pass in elements one by one, or you can say I want to offer the whole a whole chunk. I want to offer a whole sub range at once. And the you can now with with Fina you can now say okay does my my appender or my, my sink in general, does it accept these kind of larger chunks? And here, when you are doing appending, then you are very much interested in taking a chunk if your range that you're passing in, that chunk that you're passing in, if that has a range, a, a, size, um, a size function, because then you can do the reserve. So you say, well, if this thing has a size, give it to me as a whole, give it to me, give it all to me at the same time. And then I will make sure that I call my reserve um, and then append all the elements. And then basically do what I would do normally. I would just go back basically for, to, to the base case that, that then just do, does the end place back. And, but before I do, do the reserve. Um, this is one use case, uh, but that's not the only one. Uh, here's another one, for example. Files can only usually write memory buffers, right? So when you're calling fwrite, you have to pass a memory buffer. Well, um, you could write a chunk that is 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 only um, that only fits contiguous ranges, where you say, okay, if I if you have a contiguous range that you can pass to me, give it to me all at once, and then I can write it with a single call. I can write it into a file, so I can append to a file. And if not, well, then I have to write to the file bit by bit. So um, this is basically uniform treatment of, of strings and files. So you can open a file, and then with the appender, um, you can format stuff directly into your file. Now, what about performance? How good is this uh, when, we, when we use uh, ranges as strings? Now, I made a little um, benchmark here. Um, it's, it's a trivial formatting task. I'm just going to write something that repeats A 10 times, B 10 times, C 10 times. So it's a very simple formatter. And, and the formatter is, is very simple. Um, um, yeah, you cannot write bits to files. You can only write bytes to files. Um, so, the, so the formatter here does, um, is, is formatting 10 times and some one individual character, and that's that's essentially what this is. Repeat n that we previously had, and we're going to write it first um, as a handwritten loop that fills the buffer just with a handwritten loop, and then um, that's that's our straw man, and then we are going to have an appender which is again this buffer, um, and the buffer is 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 again doing doing exactly the same. It's essentially also just. Attach, uh, uh, appending things to the end of the buffer and incrementing the buffer, uh, the, the end of the buffer. So, um, and this was basically the handwritten loop. And this is the same that does the same with ranges. You just say append to the buffer, uh, and then you're writing these repeat n formatters. And the speed difference, if repeat n is iterator based, um, then you still have 50% overhead. If repeat n actually supports internal iteration, then the overhead is only 15%. So you're getting very close to handwritten loops. This, this formatter, um, these formatters are very, very efficient. 
And this is really testing the worst case because this repeat n internally is so simple. If you have to do actual work in the formatter, like when you're formatting a double, um, then the difference would actually be, be, be smaller. It would, it would be, the difference would get even smaller. Now, um, here's another example that we can do. Um, so let's have a, a toy basic string implementation. Um, because I can't reach into the standard basic string implementation, so I have a toy basic string implementation. And you have essentially just three pointers, um, the begin and the end and the end of your, your buffer, the end of the memory. And we again have this trivial formatting task. And when you're doing this uh, in a normal way, using m place back, um, then you, you do your reserve, which is, which is fine. That, that's going to be efficient. It's going to find out that the concat is... 3 times 10, so it's going to be length 30, and it's going to do the reserve. And then um, you are calling this operator for appending, um, and it does a regular m place back. And there is actual, um, there's actually some inefficiency here, because this m place back has to find out each and every time if you reach the end of your string, and whether to reallocate. And this check is actually uh, cost actually costs time. So you can actually gain efficiency by not doing the standard appender here, but instead use the fact that your reserve already made sure that you allocated enough memory. So essentially you know that your, your, your buffer can be now written to without any checks. And that's uh, quite a bit more efficient. Um, so the string was only 30 characters, and we used actual heap allocation. So there was actually, actually allocated uh, memory on the heap. And we still gained about 20% time um, by, by omitting this check, this overflow check, each time we appended a string. Um, unfortunately, this only works if you have your own basic string implementation, because such an uninitialized buffer is not exposed by basic string or std vector. But it would be probably worthwhile. Now, um, there are, there's more performance uh, that, that could be had. Um, so if, for example, not all the snippets implement size, um, all your formatters, there could be a customization point minimum size. So a, a concat, which concats all these, these snippets, um, could expose a minimum size where it knows that it's, it's the, basically the sum of the minimum size of the components. So um, if some of them know their size, then the minimum size would just be their size. But if they cannot calculate their size up front, they could actually return zero and say, well, I don't know how much, gonna, how much room I'm going, to need, uh, I'm going to need. I can't tell you any minimum size. Um, and that way, you can at least uh, avoid these, these reallocations partially. Now, um, what you could also do is uh, have a uh, optimized I.O. streams. So when you are usually, how these work is that you have some I.O. buffer and um, that, that gets filled. And as soon as that I.O. buffer is full, that sector or that, that cluster is written to disk. Now, that buffer could be replaced with your own buffer. And as long as the size actually knows yep, or, or tells you this is, this is going to be good enough, the remaining part of your buffer is going to be large enough, again, you can write without any end checks. And only at the very end, when you're saying, oh, this is going to overlap my buffer, um, then you need to switch to code that actually does end checks. So um, here you may have also a customization point max size. Now, here's the conclusion of my talk. Uh, ranges are very useful. Um, and we used index-based ranges and generators primarily uh, to improve the performance over what C++20 has in terms of iterator-based ranges and we unify ranges with text formatting. Thank you very much. Um, and here is the GitHub reference of our library, and you, if you want to play around with it. Um, and said all that, I hate the range-based for loop because it encourages people to write things like that while they really should write it like that. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, go ahead.